can we start? Okay. So it is my pleasure and privilege to discuss with two very remarkable people a session named Narratives of Power, Songs of Resistance. And we hope to explore the many ways in which those at the bottom of the power structure seek to cope and fight back. Now, Joan Mays, your incandescent performances as a slam poet has poignantly expressed the unique dilemma of black Americans haunted by the history of slavery and continuing discrimination. Sujata Gedla, your amazing journey from a teenage radical activist to an IIT research scholar, to a NRI software developer in the US, to a conductor on the New York subway, which you are today, is simply, is simply mind boggling. But you have chosen to focus on the curse of untouchability in your book. Uh, as an Indian Dalit, you've chosen to highlight you know, this uh, terrible curse of untouchability rather than on this journey which you've done in your much acclaimed book, Ants Among Elephants. Both of you come from completely different cultures and social milieus, and yet you share a common legacy of belonging to communities that have been ruthlessly oppressed by power elites. The relation between race and caste has been a subject debated for a very, very long. So has the topic of whether slavery and untouchability and which was worse. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, who had first-hand experience of how racial discrimination worked in the US when he studied there as a student, discusses this in some detail and comes to some interesting conclusions. He said that while at first glance it would appear that the slave is at a disadvantage to an untouchable because an untouchable has some legal rights as a citizen, whereas the slave was just a piece of property and who had no legal rights at all. The way it operates, and this is particularly true today, uh, the civil society, the religious sanction to uh, untouchability in India is something which is far more crushing uh, than uh, you know, any law. And of course, laws you can change uh, quite easily, uh, as we have seen. But untouchability is something uh, which is taking uh, a very, very long time to go in India. And it still operates in many, many overt and insidious ways. Now, you have responded in different ways to oppression and discrimination. Jovan May, your rhetorical power and theatrical skills displayed particularly in front of young audiences, many of them school children, has had huge impact. Sujata Gedla, in a completely different way, your relentless matter-of-fact prose describing the trials and tribulations of an untouchable family is a remarkable expose of how the caste system haunts both rural and urban India. Yet there are interesting commonalities, I find. The close bonds between both of you and your family are one. Nana, Jovan May's grandmother, obviously was a huge influence on him from his childhood shaping his songs of resistance to the narratives of power. So does Sujata Gidla, whose revolutionary uncle and valiant mother are major influences in a quest for liberation from the shackles of caste. I find it particularly intriguing and interesting that in a land where you, Jovan Mays, are fighting racial oppression as an American black, Sujata Gidla, an Indian Dalit, has found refuge from the relentless caste oppression that haunts Indian society. It would be interesting to explore the paradoxes crisscrossing race, caste, and also class. But yet, as we've seen in Trump's America, there's a vast gulf between the white and black working classes in many places, 
or in the manner in which Sujata Gedla's uncle faced caste, caste prejudice even in a revolutionary Marxist party. And finally, this brings us to the role of mainstream politics and electoral democracy in the fight against power elites. Now, I'm particularly interested in that because I've uh, done a biography of Mayavati. And um, she, she used uh, the power of democracy uh, and the instrument of elections uh, to give empowerment to the Dalits, at least in a limited manner. So I would like to ask both of them or raise these issues during our discussions of what kind of potential alliances with other social groups are possible for victimized communities such as the black Americans uh, and Indian Dalits. Uh, and of course, Mayavati I mentioned, but also in the US we've had this phenomenon of two terms by a black American president. So I think it would be very, very interesting to discuss all this. So I'm going to now sit down. And uh, so I'm going to turn to Jovan first uh, and uh, ask him to put his poetry in the context of uh, what has been happening in the United States, particularly in the past uh, a couple of years, where there has been a lot of tension, uh, a lot of racial tension. And also um, our discussions earlier about this amazing poem which you wrote called The Burning House, uh, uh, your uh, experience with Harry Belafonte, the Calypso singer, and his anecdote about what Martin Luther King told him just a week before he was assassinated. So, Jovan, can you put this in context? I, yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks everybody for being here, um, coming out this morning, to spend some time with us. Um, yeah, uh, uh, 2014 was a very um, intriguing year, I think, for the environment um, of recognition of police brutality in a more wide sense in, um, in our news specifically. Um, if you were to have a conversation with my father, um, he might be the first person to let you know that police brutality is a long discussed issue that has been present for his whole life. So um, it's been interesting sort of seeing some um, more publicizing of it, especially in light specifically of um, um, when a poem was written by me and my teammate called um, The Burning House, which really took place in 2014 in response to Trayvon Martin um, and, and, and um, his murder. And uh, uh, the story goes is um, we were invited to um, a dinner um, to go see Harry Belafonte speak. And um, Harry Belafonte uh, was a really, really young, a young man um, during the civil rights movement um, who was really affiliated with the civil rights movement during that time. And um, he got to spend some time with Martin Luther King Jr. before Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. And as a young man speaking to a, a very tired and somewhat delirious um, Dr. King figure after a speech, he came to him and said, Dr. King, Dr. King, it's so exciting. Um, what's happening with the civil rights movement? You did it. You passed it. In the, you know, and now everything's going to be you know, flourishing for, for African Americans. And Dr. King gave him this quote that said, um, you know, in response to that, Harry Belafonte asked Dr. King, well, how do you feel about that? And Dr. King said, I can't shake the feeling that I'm integrating my people into a burning house. And um, when I had heard this statement, both me and my teammate looked at each other and were like, this makes so much sense. Um, that the sort of assimilation of this culture, what, what comes with it is the expectation of um, being silent about the things that happened um, in order to be accepted into the society. And in particular, this conflict that has always been kind of omnipresent um, with uh, um, the nonviolent movements and, and, and ideals of Dr. King um, received really from, from, from Gandhi have always kind of been into question because at what point in time does a violent resistance need to happen um, is, 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 the, is the question, the impetus that sort of strikes me and my teammates. So we asked ourselves the question, what is mercy? 
What does mercy mean in a culture like this? Do you ever get back what was taken from you? Or does what was taken from you ever get recognized in the mainstream society? And so we constructed a poem about this called The Burning House. And in The Burning House, um, we ask questions like, um, you know, why is there no Malcolm X Day in the United States of America? Why is there no day for Marcus Garvey or Huey P. Newton? Our, our heroes are, are chosen for us. Um, and, 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 and if we're supposed to be celebrated as one side in our city, in our country, we have a Martin Luther King Jr. Day where everybody gets off work, but nobody actually celebrates Martin Luther King Jr. People only want the nice docile side of him. They don't want the burning house side of him. And as a poet, I think it's my job to try to bring people into interaction um, with the burning house side of Dr. King and the perspectives of a culture right now that has patiently waited in line for all its human rights, but still to this day um, has to go through the process of grooming our young children to go out in the world and interact with police authorities in hopes that they come home alive. Um, which we don't really feel like is fair inside of our spacing. So, now, would you like to recite a few verses? Uh, because this is really powerful stuff. So, just a few verses, uh, you know, if I may request. So. Yeah. Um, let's see here. In the aspects of justice, peace is just a dove with a bomb in its mouth a slow fuse on a silence undetonated. When Zimmerman's verdict came back, when we caught word of Mike Brown, I actually felt the news snap the gra grenade pin inside of me. What is mercy? What is mer mercy? From Strange Fruit to Fruitville Station, the house is burning. Just when King was delivered to Michael's final destination, what is mercy? Um, let me find a second verse here. Um, yes, um, our heroes are choosing, chosen for us. Um, is this King and Gandhi shit true? Or is being docile the best means of our assimilation? Why is there no Malcolm X Day? No day for Garvey, Hewton, Newton. Um, our heroes are chosen for us. Token blacks now window dress the White House, hiding the fact that this class is segregated. We are reduced to welfare lines, prison visits, and gang ties. When black skin is still a bullseye, ask yourself, what is progress? We never traded blood for the blood with the beast. Didn't get a chance to lynch Bull Connor like Saddam, never once burned a cross, never shot him without being fired on first, never passed a white man's severed balls around crowds of, raunting, of ranting onlookers. If returning this violence would have prevented future bloodshed, should we have traded our ballots for bullets? America's treatment of its black people was an inspiration to Hitler. Roosevelt asked him for, 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 for mercy on behalf of the Jews and was responded with, Vos Vicente Ding Vignata. Translation, what do you know of mercy? The house is burning. Poem. Amazing stuff. Amazing. Very powerful. Now, Sujata, while America is burning, uh, you as an Indian Dalit, you are in New York. Uh, do you feel the heat? Do you feel uh, a camaraderie? Because you belong to a community uh, who in a parallel universe is also facing the same kind of oppression and this kind of protests are happening uh, virtually every day across India. And the Dalit movement, in this, particularly in this past few years, uh, have been burgeoning. So thousands of miles away from India, but America is burning, what do you feel? I feel very much like it's my own people burning. Because actually, I have to tell you that uh, when I first went to America, I was looking for uh, you know, political and social groups to associate with. I went looking for BSU, the Black Students' Union. I mean, they looked at me strangely, but that's how I felt. Um, well, my first, uh, my first demonstration that I participated was in uh, Rodney King in Los Angeles, who was beaten up, and the beating was uh, caught, on the, caught on tape. And uh, subsequently, I participated in many, many demonstrations against police brutality against black people. But the most important one I would like to uh, tell you about is uh, 
In uh, 2005, I think that the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, they are the fascist, white, white supremacist fascists who believe in violence, who are opposed to black people, Jewish people, immigrants, and gays. Uh, they came to New York City to recruit people to KKK. If, if I participated in a rally that uh, gathered 10,000 New Yorkers to stop the Klan from recruiting. I think that uh, I'm very proud of that. So we did stop them. Yeah. And I do feel that the struggles of black people are my struggles, not as an outsider, but as part of you. And in fact, that, in fact I do argue with black people um, and they do say, you're not black. Why do you, why do you think that you know better, what is better for is us? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I do um, participate in black struggles very much. You know, uh, uh, Yvonne, you know, when she talks about uh, her struggle being yours, but yet you have this paradox that she found shelter uh, in the America, which has been so, so uh, ruthless and so unfeeling about their own uh, marginalized, victimized, exploited community. But yet um, a migrant, an immigrant like Sujata has escaped uh, caste oppression from India and she does feel um, to some extent liberated uh, from that kind of oppression. So I'd like you to explain a bit, and we were discussing this earlier, about how uh, uh, immigrant population uh, and the privileges they have, and you had some very interesting things to say, and then I'll turn to Sujata uh, for her response. Well, yeah. Um uh, like, like was said earlier in my description, I, I work with a lot of students um, inside of our environment. I've got a very fortunate opportunity to be a poet laureate in the hometown that I grew up in of Aurora, Colorado. Aurora is the only majority minority um, um, large city inside of the state of Colorado. Um, but of the 65% minority identified individuals, um, one in five people in that class identify as immigrant and refugee based. Um, so I work with a lot of students um, who are just coming into the country, who are just exploring what Americana means and, and belongingness and, 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 and um, um, a new nationalism that could exist within this spacing. And um, it's interesting when you work with a Somali boy or you work with an Ethiopian um, girl who are now um, coming into the space with the background of their country, but then learning slowly but surely that they're sort of with their permission or without their permission, getting adapted and adopted into um, being African American, even though that they are based, steeped in their African um, roots. And um, it's, it's really interesting um, because, you know, with, with the way that uh, uh, citizenship works and all this learning that needs to happen about the country, it's always the thing that like doesn't get talked about that I think is a very common experience of being a young black boy growing up in America or a refugee or an immigrant coming to our space being like, but wait, what happened to black people? Uh, but wait, what happened to those Native American people? But wait, Japanese internment camps, what, what, what happened there? There's always this like this reclamation moment of being like, what? What, what happened? Why, didn't, why aren't you talking about that? Why, why didn't you talk about what just happened? That seems like a big thing. That was 400 years of slavery. Why aren't you talking about that? And, and, and when you get to work with these students and, and then start um, the explanation of what happens, all of a sudden um, the pretty patina of coming to this place that is supposed to be the land of the free um, becomes a little bit more of an investigation of at what risk at what trade-off does that does that come from i think it's also interesting for most african americans where we do separate um, or have an interesting relationship with the refugee community is that we don't get a particular nationalism we don't have like um, a place of origin that's going to come and protect us for the u.n when we're um field dressed by our own community um inside of america which is a very similar um, thing um, that I think happens. So I find the conversation to be really, really interesting and dynamic because um, 
while um, we may not come from the same place geographically, we come from similar backgrounds of treatment that then kind of bring us into a space of similarity. And what happens in those discussions are usually very refreshing to me. Sujata, um, you know, you've um, escaped uh, from India in many ways, um, you know, from uh, what, you, what you've written so evocatively in your book, uh, Untouchability, uh, which operates in many different ways in India. And um, the America, uh, which is your new home, has obviously offered you, because uh, you, you know, in our conversations and in your interviews, you do feel um, quite satisfied in the U.S. in many ways. Could you explain, you know, how the same America, uh, which has been very oppressive, as Jovan uh, describes, uh, how has it worked for you? I know, how is it better than India? Um, first of all, I'd like to mention this, that uh, I know how Jovan feels about what he talked about. Blacks are the people who built uh, the American economy. They have been there for 400 years, and yet, when the immigrants come, they have all the opportunities that are denied to the American blacks. And I know how it feels. And uh, especially when he talks about like black immigrants from Africa coming, and they get more opportunities to, um, to climb the social ladder than the black people in America. And I know how exactly that feels. He, he has black skin, and the African immigrants have black skin, and yet, they have more opportunities than the American, American blacks. I had the same very experience. Um, that's actually the root of why I wrote the book. Uh, I used to think that untouchability has to do with my religion, that I'm a Christian and that's why I was treated as um, untouchable. And when I came across high caste uh, Christians, like for example, the Syrian Christians in um, Kerala and the uh, Portuguese Christians in Goa, I, I began to think, why? I'm Christian and they are Christian. Why am I untouchable and why are, why are they not untouchable? Why am I poor and they are not? And it really, really bothered me for the longest time. And when I had guts to like openly confront it, that's when I wrote the book. Uh, it, it started as an, an, an inquiry into what makes some people untouchable. And it's exactly the same thing that's happening to him. My skin is black, their skin is black. Why do I don't have opportunities that they have? Um, I think that, you know, uh, the black is, American blacks, the racism is like caste very much. It doesn't have to do with skin color. Uh, like for example, you're a light-skinned black man and you could, you're lighter than me and yet, you wouldn't be ha having the same opportunities that I do. That is because I think that the fact that one of your ancestors came from Africa and was brought as a slave, that is what determines your social status in America, not, um, not actually the fact that you're black. Uh, I mean, any visible feature that indicates that one of your ancestors is black makes you black. And black, like untouchables, is a caste, and that's why American blacks are treated that way, despite having the same skin color as African uh, immigrants. And I have also noticed that, uh, you know, um, uh, African immigrants, they don't really see themselves as uh, same as uh, American black people. They think that they're superior. And uh, I ride cabs and I talk with uh, cab drivers, and I came across many cab drivers who are really dark from Africa, and they say that we came here, you know, after being highly educated, we're hardworking, we're trying to better our lives, whereas American blacks are lazy and they don't work. That is their opinion. So skin color does not have much to do with uh, the oppression and the opportunities that you get to uh, better yourself socially. It has to do with the fact that you are descendants of the people who were brought as slaves to America. That is my observation. Um, um, 
it's very interesting what she said, and obviously there is a fair amount of solidarity which she feels uh, with the struggle of the black American people. But tell me, uh, in your struggle, uh, how much uh, uh, would uh, migrant communities, and particularly uh, migrant communities who are also seen as uh, the underclass uh, you know, in America, who face uh, uh, their own share of discrimination, um, how, how much is their uh, participation and collaboration uh, you know, in, the, in the struggle? Is there any sort of attempt to get them together? Uh, I think, you know, my hopes is that in the long run, I feel like the place that I come from, Aurora, is like almost a utopian society. We, we, it, it's rare to have the sort of influx that we have, but in the same degree where you have, you know, 200,000 maybe people um, that come from, um, you know, that are mostly brown-skinned or immigrant-based, um, there, there's, there, you know, one of the things that, that separates us very easily is, is our languages, right, you know, and sort of merging ourselves beyond the barrier of language. So I would not say that I've seen a cohesive movement um, happen, at least in, in, in Aurora, where we are sort of together in our, in our moving forwardness. But what, what doesn't change is that the vast majority of this group is, is, is locked into the middle class um, and, 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 the, and, the, and, and the lower class. And as that starts to become a, a dominant portion of our populace, look, in our city, there's all these really corporate grocery stores that come with like a, a hardware store and, and, and all these other shopettes that are, you know, kind of really commercially studied to be placed into our space. And what happens often is that these spaces only last for a few months because there's nobody there to b that wants to buy um, a Walmart cantaloupe. Like nobody wants to get food there. So then these buildings go out of business and more independent merchants from a lot of different backgrounds come into these spaces and turn them into grocery stores that are more suited for their community or for their culture. And then what you find is more people than are forced to intersect into somebody else's culture. And in that intersection, I think is gonna create many more blossoms that we can't necessarily predict that are gonna connect more immigrant, migrant, refugee populace with uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans inside of this community. And um, I, I think we're just starting to see the first steps of kind of what the possibility is of folks understanding that um, we're on more of an even field than a separate field. Sujatha, uh, one of the very interesting aspects uh, in your book uh, is, of course, uh, the story about your uncle, uh, the revolutionary and the Naxalite leader uh, who was uh, founder of the People's War Group. And uh, I was a Naxalite uh, many, many years ago. Uh, and uh, I, of course, was a great admirer of your uncle. But you uh, also bring in this new dimension, and you were a Naxalite activist. Uh, you were imprisoned um, also. So one of the aspects which I find so, so fascinating in your book is how you uh, expose the kind of caste prejudice which your uncle faced even in a Marxist revolutionary party like uh, the People's War Group. Um, and uh, so I would like you to explain uh, how this works, that how uh, even uh, um, communism has not been able to really relate to this uh, caste problem in India. Um. You know, communism, it, it, it's not the problem with, the com with communism or Marxism. It's the, it's the problem of the people who are running these so-called communist parties. They all come from upper castes, mostly Brahmin people, and they have uh, no agenda to address caste problems. Caste is a special kind of problem. It is very much related to the class, class but yet you cannot just reduce it to class. Caste must be tackled differently. Just as in America, there's working class and there are black people. I mean, does the working class uh, take up the anti-racist struggle or not? They must. Um, 
in the beginning, the American Communist Party did not think that they had to address the black racism, uh, question of racism separately or specially. That knowledge, that consciousness was brought from outside, from the USSR, from Lenin and the Bolsheviks, said that you cannot just, uh, you, what do you call it, uh, push it under the rung, rug, the, the problem of racism. Right. You have to have special pro program to address the caste question, and you must conduct struggles specially uh, on behalf of the black people. And we don't have such a knowledge coming from outside or inside to the Indian Communist parties. They think that class is everything and caste will automatically disappear once the class question is uh, resolved. That is not possible. Any revolutionary party that wants to change the world, any revolutionary party that wants to make a workers' revolution must take up the caste question separately and they must lead the uh, anti-caste struggle. Without that, they're not going to succeed. And at the same time, Dalits themselves cannot uh, conduct struggles to liberate themselves. They have to be part of the working class uh, struggles to, to, to succeed in any way for equal rights. Yeah, I, I, I would like to respond to that and uh, look at the class question uh, in the US, particularly in Trump's America, because Trump uh, boasts of a constituency, which he often says, uh, you know, uh, also has many poor and deprived people. So how does that work today in, in the US? Well, I think something that I find interesting, um, I guess I didn't expect to find um, when I first um, did my currency exchange here, which I didn't know that Gandhi would be on the money. And, 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 and um, when I see Gandhi on the money, it makes me think about our celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King, how we want this identification um, that we are about freedoms um, and we are about the upward movement um, of those who have struggled in this space, um, but the real recognition um, of that um, only happens in these sort of kind of trivial ways. And so these great um, people that have, have, have entered into this network all of a sudden sort of get um, perverted in a way that is, is, is interesting to me. Um, when we commit ourselves to Dr. Dr. King or Gandhi, we're, we're committing ourselves um, to remove our complacencies and have to relinquish our privileges in order to get everybody else on board. Um, but we know that that's not the case. Uh, the case is that um, there are still forces that are unwilling to negotiate having that thing on the board with them. And as long as that complacency exists, what we're starting to see, especially in America, is all of a sudden we have this new president that is promising people jobs, but the jobs that he is promising white people in America are the jobs that white people for a long time refuse to work. So now that white people want to start getting into fields, now white people want to start building infrastructure. Where were y'all during the Transcontinental Railroad? Where were y'all during, dur during, um, dur during the Jim Crow era and, and, and cotton picking era? Where were y'all tending your fields? When, when people told you to not, to, 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 to not abuse the land in this way, and you still did, but now y'all want to come along, huh? Now we want to start building a wall. Y'all want to build a wall, huh? Now we start talking about a pipeline. Y'all want to build a pipeline, huh? All of a sudden you want to get your hands wet. You want to take care of your own homes. You want to take care of your own children. You want to do things that, that, that are supposed to be now new and trendy, right? We want to make TV shows about flipping houses when people have been flipping your houses for years now and building these houses. And I find the same thing that if people don't recognize that, um, we are going to be in a great risk um, as a country for upheaval um, to be just a necessary reaction. You know, why else would you, what else would you expect for something back into a corner this way to react? And we see this so often, and I, I think where I, where I, where I reach to you, and, and, and I, 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 I reach to you when I hear about the necessary viewpoints that need to happen with caste versus class, it brings me to this quote by James Baldwin. Um, in referencing America, and he says, the real question this republic is going to have to ask is just how long and expensive is this funeral gonna be, right? How are they gonna negotiate the continued um, 
um, pressing down of somebody else's voice um, and, and until it becomes something that's going to be such a mess that, that it can't be cleaned up. And quite frankly, I think that's what we're talking about right now is this mess, aren't we? Right? And if it's even possible to clean it up, right? Um, Sujata, you know, uh, um, you're thousands of miles away from India, but you must be following what's uh, happening to the Dalit movement uh, in India. Uh, and you have two developments. Uh, one is that parties like the Bhajan Samaj Party uh, and its leader, Mayavati, I've written a biography on, uh, they are in decline. And they have not been able to uh, realize the promise which at one time seemed uh, when Kanchiram started this movement that of the political empowerment of the Dalits reaching a situation where they could control uh, or at least influence uh, largely mainstream politics. And so how do you see uh, the Dalit movement now? How do you see the emerging uh, much more aggressive, much more radical, much more agitation-based Dalit groups like the Bhim Army uh, and its leader Chandrasekhar Azad who's been imprisoned. Uh, how do you see Jignesh Mevani, who although uh, has uh, won his seat uh, in an assembly poll, but he's also talking a new language. So how do you, how do you view what is uh, happening uh, uh, in Dalit activism and Dalit politics in India? Well, actually, first of all, I would like to mention it probably will displease you both that I'm not a fan of Gandhi. I'm not a fan of a Martin Luther King. Uh, my idol is Mar uh, Malcolm X. Uh, when I didn't know anything about Malcolm, uh, Martin Luther King, and I came to America when, when they said that he's a follower of Gandhi's nonviolence, at once I could decide my stand on Martin Luther King. And uh, that's how it happened. And uh, about the Dalit movement, uh, BSP, you know, everybody says that it, it has given pride to untouchables, that it, it, it gave them self-confidence self and dignity. And uh, look what happened to it. Nothing, nothing came, off, came out of it. Mayawati made herself very, very, very rich. And uh, her, her brother made, her, made himself very, very, very rich. And that is, that is all that happened to, uh, to, to Dalits and, uh, uh, you know, uh, casteism in India. Mayawati failed to do anything because, first of all, uh, BSP is a parliamentary party. They are an electoral, electoral party. And so what they can do for Dalits will be limited by the framework within which they chose to operate. And Jignesh Mewani right now uh, seems very militant and his uh, protests against UNA floggings are very, very admirable. But then again, uh, he's chosen to operate within the framework of electoral politics and there is only so much he can do from within it. So I, uh, I applaud his uh, sincerity but I think that his rhetoric is empty rhetoric. So uh, I'm going to follow up because you've said something quite, quite uh, harsh about, uh, you know, sort of Dalit leaders so far. So what would you f uh, feel is the way forward? You know, Dalit, uh, untouchability is not some kind of habit or hobby. It's not a tradition. It's not a custom. It has a certain reason why it is still there. You have to look at the reasons why uh, untouchability is still being practiced. Who is it benefiting to perpetuate caste system? And how are they benefiting? And you have to look at that aspect of untouchability and strike at that. You cannot legislate away untouchability. You cannot protest away untouchability. You have to look at the material basis for untouchability and strike at that. And I feel that the untouchability has, a root, has roots in agricultural structure in India. Agricultural structure in India is such that the landowners need plentiful labor at will, reliably. And that's the reason they, uh, they consign these people to untouchability and deny them any opportunity because they want them to be working on their land. 
and they, do, they don't do anything else. And so in rural areas, when untouchables send their children to schools, that, is, that makes landlords very unhappy. And that's when these uh, mass murders, like the ones that happened in uh, Andhra happened. And it's the same thing in urban areas. When Rohit Vemula was uh, hounded to his death, it is exact, they're doing exactly the same thing. He, they are telling them that Dalits do not belong in universities. They belong in the fields working as labor for landlords. So think about that. Think about changing the agricultural, agricultural structure where you don't need uh, dependent labor who cannot be allowed to do anything else. So what they need is restructuring of uh, Indian economy, especially the agriculture. And, and a very quick follow-up. Do you see yourself ever coming back to India and getting back into politics? Um, you know, I'm a Marxist. Marxists are internationalists. Uh, you know, I was born as a Dalit, but it doesn't mean that I, I don't feel equally about uh, the American blacks. Uh, it's, it doesn't mean that just because uh, I'm a Dalit, I should only work for Dalits. I can very well work uh, for uh, the liberation of black people in America. Uh, but, and also, uh, as globalization, what happens to them in America has influence and what happens to Dalits in India. So all of these things are connected and you can struggle anywhere that is convenient for you and that, is, that works for you. Jivan, uh, before I uh, throw the session open to questions, uh, your brief response to that and also maybe uh, another verse, I mean, I'm sort of, you know, uh, I've always wanted you to uh, recite your poetry. So just to leave uh, you know, the audience with uh, maybe a few verses of your poetry. But a brief response to what she said about Martin Luther King, about Gandhi, and the fact that you need radical activism yeah, throughout. Yeah, it, it's tough. I, I, it's such a tough, a tough way to understand things. I, I've grown up in such a mixed community um, of, of people that it's, it's hard for me to not, not find accountability amongst... Um, especially middle class white people, um, to understand that um, while we suffer, you're going to suffer as well until there's a recognition um, um, to lift us all up in the same way. And if we don't hold our leaders accountable for what they've done, for, for removing the American economy and, and moving all of the labor uh, beyond borders and now trying to bring it back in order to salvage the white middle class, um, that negotiation becomes a very difficult negotiation. But the one thing that I find interesting, whether or not you wanna be, you know, one wants to be in support of Dr. King or Malcolm X or Huey P. Newton or insert whatever black leader you want um, is that, um, they were all assassinated for their beliefs. And um, in, in, in a way that the reaction to their assassination um, did not um, induce a larger, bigger idea. It did not um, create more leadership, right? Um, the civil rights movement was very dependent of, a, a, on, on common white people seeing the injustice and helping move the agenda forward and speed that agenda forward. And as long as we still have this kind of thing that's happening inside of our environment, which I like to call American complacency, where, you know, Trayvon Martin lasts in the white community um, through a cup of coffee in the morning. Trayvon Martin in the black community is still here, right? There's, it's, still, it's still like a discussion point that we have to negotiate this imbalance. And so as long as one group is unwilling to, nego uh, to negotiate the imbalance and the other is, we kind of catch ourselves in a weird situation. You said you wanted some poem, uh, some poetry, yeah, though. Some, you, know, you know, the thing is that there is hardly much difference between when, you know, between your poem and what you speak, because it, it's so closely integrated to each other. Sorry, you know, I, I was saying that with Javan, it's quite amazing <laughs> when he speaks and when he recites poetry. It's the, it's got that same rhythm, you know, and that is why he's, you know, you keep on wanting to hear him. But I think we run out of time, That's fine. and I think we need questions. So, um, if you could have some questions. This lady in the front row. Oh. My right. Guess. I, yeah. Let's see the first. Poetry. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Some poetry. Uh, I, I just sort of, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's audience request. Yeah. 
um, um, in the wake of Compton-born Stanford graduate Richard Sherman's post-game rant, my high school football teammate's mother offered a sentiment via Facebook. It reads, Richard Sherman, what a piece of shit. This is what happens when you let them out the ghetto. Huh. I bet you want me to be a particular kind of black, don't you, ma'am? Not the threatening kind. Not the angry woman going off at Walmart. Not boys arguing on the bus stop. You know, the kind that's not dark enough to eat you. The kind that won't swallow you to make direction become unknown. I bet you want the type with stars in it, dressed in Bill Cosby sweaters and Oprah suits, but not like the ocean's bottom, the coffee with cream, the I have a dream type of black. And I bet you want me proper speaking, pants above my ass and slacks kind of black, you know, Calypso. Not quite Gavi or Marley, but don't worry, be happy, let's get up, stand up, just black enough for you to pose in a picture with on your vacation to Jamaica. Instagram shot with an African baby, black. I bet you want me to twerk at the art gallery while you drink white wine on first Fridays, and I bet you want the type of black to win you a Super Bowl, but not Richard Sherman black, heck, not Jameis Winston black, heck, not Deshaun Jackson black, just black enough to still be cute. Poem. question is from Sujata. Uh, there's this book of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, uh, Annihilation of Caste. Uh, so there's this fo forward written by Arundhati Roy, The Doctor and the Saint. So there she has described how there was a great difference of opi opinion between Dr. Ambedkar and Gandhi, and Gandhi was never in support of the abolishment of ca casteism from India. So what, and also he never support, uh, he, he, uh, uh, referred to untouchables as harijans and using harijans uh, the word harijans he kind of excluded them keep from it, the normal community keep it brief so that so uh, wha it. what is what what do you think about uh, gandhi's perception of uh, untouchability uh, gandhi was a very ca was a very casteist man he wanted to uh, preserve the uh, caste system he only wanted to prettify it by doing some cosmetic changes. That was what, uh, actually, you know, uh, I should tell you, in my ninth class, we had a lesson in uh, Hindi class in which Gandhi says that uh, bungies should be doing bungie business, that is, scavengers should still be removing shit, but we must respect them for what they're doing, not treat them as untouchables. So he's saying that they still have to do their caste occupation. They should be, uh, they should be confined to the caste occupation. And the only difference is now we should respect them for what they did. How is that, how, how, how could one see Gandhi as an anti-casteist? He really wanted to preserve the caste system. And why he even paid lip service to uh, you know, the upliftment of untouchables because the, as uh, the Hindus needed a majority against Muslims for political representation in uh, the British government. That's the only reason Hindu leaders ever took up, ever paid lip service to untouchability. And in fact, there is, um, uh, Eli Eleanor Zelliot wrote a book on Ambedkar and she says that when the mic was off, what Gandhi said to his secretary was, if we don't contain these people, the untouchables and Muslim hooligans will get together and kill all Hindus. That was his fear. And Gandhi was a very racist man. And Gandhi was not only a casteist man, he was a very racist man in Africa when they were fighting against the British instituting the passport where everybody has to carry the identity card. He said that uh, Indians are war hardworking people. They should not be required to carry these things. But the black people are kafirs, they're losers, and they're lazy. Yes, they can carry the passport. Why do we need to carry passports? So Gandhi was uh, actually very openly casteist and racist, and any red-blooded untouchable will know that, will know what Gandhi was to untouchables. I'm sorry for my ignorance, but I thought unt uh, casteism and untouchability was a Hindu thing. I'm suddenly hearing about this Christian thing. How did it get into Christianity? Okay, you know, um, 
It's a mistake to think that caste system is a religion, a religious system. It is not. Uh, caste is a social institution. It's not a religious institution. And uh, what my opinion is that caste system began and it, st it, it started being consolidated and to, to, um, to provide ideological religious justification for this uh, inherently discriminatory system, you needed a religion. And Hinduism came after the caste system and it came as a support for the caste system. And so it's a religion tailor-made for caste system. So shorn of all mysticism, Hinduism is nothing but a religious prop for um, casteism. But it still doesn't mean that ca uh, caste is a, a religious institution. It is a social institution. And that is why when Muslims came to India and afterwards uh, Christianity came to India, the caste system did not disappear uh, like the Dalits hoped to. Dalits thought that like by by becoming Christians, they could escape uh, untouchability, but they could not because it's a social institution. And it's the same thing with black people. Black people in America took uh, Islam, thinking that you know once you get out of Christian Christianity, you will be equal. But no, their racism still continues. So all, both racism and casteism are social institutions, but it looks very much like Hinduism. Juwan, would you like to? Oh. No. Yeah, okay. Any more questions? There, 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 back. Um, thank you both. Um, and I, uh, my question is about Barack Obama, I guess mostly because he's the most well-known um, African-American. To the outside Speak world, up. to the outside world, it looks like, uh, you know, he's an African-American and he stands with the community. However, like, I know that he was, you know, born to uh, an African migrant and was raised by his white family. So I guess I wanted to ask whether to the inside community, whether people felt like he stands with them and, um, or whether he's kind of an outsider within those African-Americans who stand from slaves. And by extension, um, what does Modi as a president in India, what does that mean to the other backward uh, castes? Thank you. You want to get that first? I guess I'm supposed to talk about Barack Obama, correct? Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, uh, if you go all across the, the American landscape, there's a lot of black mayors um, all across America, and I feel like they're scapegoated um, to deal with all the shit that nobody else was wanting to deal with, um, and that their terms are going to be defined by them not being able to achieve the equality that they wanted to achieve in their stint in time because of how messy the recipient of, of the situation they've been kind of brought into. I look at Barack in the same regards. I love Barack Obama. Um, I, I think that um, I, I will never forget um, um, he is by far the most timelineable um, African-American moment that has existed inside of my lifetime thus far. And, um, but I do feel like he, he is a representation of a lot of the black mayorness that happens around our country where he's been handed off um, this huge enraptured ball of mess with the expectation to be able to even rivet, rivet it a little bit. And, and I think that um, in a social way, um, to a degree he has, but I think um, I don't look much further past the election of Donald Trump to see um, how long Barack's legacy had lasted. It lasted in those very precious, precarious times where African Americans got to see like, oh, for once we might be um, enlisted as an equal um, and to a point where we realized that um, 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 the resurrection of, of white supremacy um, has now impacted our country in a way that we didn't really realize. It, it wasn't cool to be racist when Barack was the president, right? You know, like you had to kind of put your racism on pause for a second or like say it in like privatized space. But now it's like, it's really cool to like kind of be openly racist and have all this thing out into the open. And so it's hard to really navigate um, over this next few years, um, what was the long lasting effects of Barack Obama's term and to see if the, the followers of, of um, um, sort of his missions are going to kind of um, upheave into our current administration. But um, yes, Barack Obama, me and him could hang out any day of the week because I love that guy. Yeah. Was your question directed to her as well? 
Yeah, I think you asked about Modi. Modi. So I think your thoughts on Modi. Uh, you know, but I couldn't understand what you were saying. So what would you like me to say about Modi? Yeah, sorry. Um, both the questions were kind of asking what, what it means to the communities that Barack Obama and Modi come from. Uh, what does it mean to the other backward caste that he's now a president? Uh, what do you think? Um, you know, like uh, Congress or any other party that was uh, that ruled India before uh, BJP was really not different from uh, Modi. Just as uh, in America, uh, the Democrats uh, ruling the government is no different from the Republicans or even uh, Trump. The only thing is that what uh, they are shy, shy about their uh, communalism. Congress was shy about their communism, but Congress was the pioneer of communalism. And uh, you can look at uh, 1984, uh, the, uh, the storming of the Golden Temple. Uh, it's a communal uh, attack on Sikhs. And the subsequent riots in Delhi, killing more than 3,000 Sikhs, it is communal. And it's, co it's Congress who did that. It's not the BJP. So the only difference between them and BJP is that BJP is open about it, Modi is open about it, whereas Congress was not. And it's the same thing in America. The Democrats did the same thing as what Trump did. Obama did the same thing as Trump did, ex uh, except that Barack Obama has black skin and he wasn't so open about uh, his anti-immigration and his war in the world. He dropped some number of bombs on uh, the countries. In the U.S. has hand in Syria. U.S. has its hand in Yemen. U.S. has its ha hand in everything. And Obama was no different from Trump. Trump is open about his racism. Trump is ab open about his, uh, uh, you know, uh, war, world war. And Trump is open about immigrants. That's the only difference. And the seeds of what Trump is doing were there in Obama's rule. One very quick question. One very, very quick question. Right, okay. But uh, very brief. Yes. Thank you, Sujata. Like, as a Dalit to another Dalit, question I have for you is, the book you have written is fantastic, uh, but as always has done previously, most of this literature is for a white audience or for an eco chamber. How do we do uh, works which will take us out of the eco cha chamber? How do we write so that we write for our people, like as aspiration and inspiration for our people? And what is the work that needs to go into it? Because there is a certain reason, because you have mentioned well, Mevani. Th that's fine, because we, we're really out of time. Uh, yeah. I mean, basically, he's talking about me writing for an English speaking white audience. Yeah. Uh, and it's in this book, that is an echo chamber. And you know, how do you sort of uh, do it for local Dalits and you know, who are with you? I mean, I haven't tried doing that, so I don't know. Uh, and uh, one thing I can say is that if I approached an Indian publisher first, I'm very sure that it would not have published. It would not have been published. It's because of the success in the West that the Indians have published it, and I'm glad that they did, and uh, the reception has been very well. And I think that what the, I, I wrote for the uh, white audience because they don't know anything about caste, so I, I, I uh, wrote it, I described it from the scratch, and apparently even Indians needed that, dis that kind of description. Thank you, we are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jovan. Thank you, Sujata. It was a lovely session. Our thanks to Jovan Mays and Sue.